I'm going to start right off by asking for the Windows experts in the room. Have any? No experts? Okay, how about intermediate? Okay, stand up, sir. Yes, sir. Would you like to take a jab at this question for me, please, sir? And feel free to use a lifeline if you want. I always say more analysis whenever I see something that I don't know for sure. Okay, thank you, sir. So you can keep going with the, anyone else? Um, to me, it looks a little weird to see the IPv6 and the IP4 together. So I don't know if that's a normal query or not. Okay. So I, I'm kind of leaning towards impossible. I think the gentleman over in the corner have it. Say it again, sir. Why is one log on making DNS queries to be that's exactly correct. So you have wind log on doing some pretty funky stuff there. And the only reason why I know this is malicious is it, be, it comes from a forensic report on the deeper report on the website. This is a really good report. And after my talk, you should probably check it out. One of the silly things about that report that, that I found pretty hilarious is the attackers, before they ran their ransomware, they alerted the entire domain and told them that uh, the entire domain was infected with Cobalt Strike, which we'll go over what I believe the reason was in a few minutes. Where are my pen testers, my red teamers? Do I have any not all right, would anybody like to take a stab at this question? Feel free to use ChatGPT, Google, or anything. Because my two gentlemen, I'm giving away two prizes, and they got participation points. My gentleman here actually got the 25 points for the first question. I got an A over here. Can I get A? B. I'm just guessing D because it seems something to happen. Okay. D. <laughs> so D is actually, was that you? Well, he, somebody over there said it first. Okay. So um, I'll take you how the points work in a minute. Slipper is one of my favorite, it's probably the favorite. Uh, my favorite C2, you have two others that people normally mention, Cobalt Strike and uh, Brute Retail. And I found it really hilarious that it warns you in such a way. <clears throat> and this is the actual screenshot from that. It uh, asked, actually asks you, are you an adult? And of course, you put yes. The funny thing is, if you put no here, exit the shell and come back, it'll say, no, you're not an adult. So that's just a hilarious thing about Slurry. It's, uh, it's open source if you want to test it out in your home labs legally. So before I introduce myself, I want to ask the audience, can bad attacker offset ever be a good thing for the adversary? Probably not, right? Yes, I hear yes. Yes, right? yes. could you stand up and explain why, sir? So I plan to write a full article or podcast or audio book or something on this, but these are the reasons why I think attackers can sometimes want to be loud. One of my favorite ones is sometimes that bad offset can just drive your handlers to crazy decisions, availability bias. One of my favorite ones because as you begin to see something more and more, you focus on that more, or let me take that back. As you are more familiar with certain artifacts, those become priority when there may be a more insidious one in. 
So I encourage any analysts, any pen testers to please look up biases, fallacies, because we all fall victim, even the experts. Okay, so they told me the speakers didn't work, so. I don't know, there's a, who wants to be a million? Alien or music? I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it play. Last question before I introduce myself though. Anyone wanna take a stab at this one? For 25 points. This one should be easily Googleable. Twitter is also a good source. So yeah, so if you okay. So with questions like this, um, the first thing I want to say is Twitter or X is a good source for any current cyber threat intel. Secondly, I want to say all of these are somewhat relevant, minus maybe Stuxnet. But the, the key thing to, to take away from this is Ice, D, TrickBot, and Zeus, all families of malware, they all began before 2010, but they're still relevant. So if you ask ChatGPT, it's gonna tell you none of these are relevant. Just keeping that in mind. It hallucinates the time. And so this is just a screenshot of uh, what I like to do. I like to go on Twitter and pretty much just steal people's work. <laughs> to me. Um, I, I'll blank the, uh, the, the name out in the face, obviously. And so this is me. So I, uh, before I introduce myself, I want to introduce my son, Terry Smith III. I want to introduce my wife in the back and my best friend. And then uh, my uh, pride and joy, little Tinsley Smith. They're all here. <laughs> so about me, Cyber Protection Brigade, you can read. I don't want to really read to you too much. Um, I use a uh, Mr. Robot approach when it comes to learning this stuff. So I threat hunt in a day, and at night I either work with pen testers or I do hack the box or things like that. I also have a side, uh, not a side, hustle, it's probably not appropriate to say, um, a, a home business where I consult pen testers and it's uh, it's pretty awesome to to see some of the pitfalls and the things that they deal with. It's, uh, it's pretty pretty awesome. If you want to ask me more about that offline, we could, we could talk about that after the uh, um, presentation here. I'm working on Hack the Box's new CDSA. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. No? Okay, well, they're putting out a blue team cert uh, certification, which is going to be my first, actually. And then I'm excited about Top 4 Plus fingerprinting, which we'll go over that more. Uh, Flat Earther, if uh, you want to ask me more about that, you can ask me out after the uh, presentation here. This is my first presentation, and I wanted to do something different. I've been coming here for six years or so, and I wanted to do something that uh, engaged the audience. So hope you, everyone is having fun. One of the most inspiring things to me, if you don't know what this is, this is the threat hunting maturity model. And I just love models. I love when people in the field take their time to create a, a model so that organizations can gauge where they are, gauge where their analysts are. And it inspired me so much that I put it on an individual level where I can tell my analysts, hey, you can only respond to alerts, you'll never zero. Or you're so good, you could probably build a carbon black or a, a, a end game. You're, you're that good. And that's basically my blue team maturity. And the questions that I'm asking the audience today are a part of the, uh, the threat hunting maturity exam that I give my analysts at work. So, And then this is red team maturity. I guess we don't have any red teamers in here today, which I guess I didn't get any feedback on that. But it, this is, uh, I'm pretty proud of this. I am. And, uh, I think it's, it's a good way to just gauge where people are and I think everyone just really wants to know where they are and 
in the field. I know when I first started, I, I didn't know who to talk to or who to gauge my skills off of, and, and that threat money maturity model just hit, uh, hit the nail on the head for me. So a few notes of how I want the rest of this to run. I was going to split the audience into blue and red team, but it doesn't seem like that's gonna work today. So we're going to work off the honor code. If you answer a question correctly, just please note somewhere in your phone how many points you got for that question. And then we'll tally up the points on your own, and then the top two winners will get my prizes here. Does that, does that sound good? Yeah. Sweet. All right. Um, if you are a learner in here, this is your first time, if you're just getting into the field, I highly encourage ChatGPT, just open up a chat and just start typing things in there. And as you mature in the field, just go back to that chat and start asking it more questions. I mean, uh, it's, it'll, it'll really help. Um, and just have fun. It's the end of the day. I know these uh, presentations are really, really difficult to, uh, it's, it's difficult to stay here all day. Just honestly, so I, I'm glad you're with me and loosen up and have fun. I know it's a pretty, it's not formal, but it's, it's a pretty stuffy event sometimes. So just want to have some fun here. The next one for my blue teamers, for my Sysmon aficionados, during an incident response, your team wants to use Sysmon to monitor host. Notice that the points here have uh, went up a little bit. You might want to take a stab at this for a lovely prize over here to compete for that. <clears throat> we have a B. Go over there. Yeah. I think it's D. You think it's D? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only when we have time. Well, if it's an incident response, the organization should suspect some domain admin stuff going on, some some root privilege stuff going on, and in that case, with 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 exceptions, you have a config file that's pretty exposed. There are ways to secure that config file, but not many people know it. So most of the time, it's going to be B. Some of these are debatable. So if we have a little bit of time to debate these, if you would like, but this is going to be B for this one. We're gonna have to not do that. <laughs> All right. You attempted to AS roast AS rep roast my service account, and I called you. How did I catch you? This is really good if you are uh, if you work with Active Directory a lot. I just learned this like last week. Bee. This one is gonna be a little bit harder. I heard a B. Another B. Well, if you chose B, you're not correct. Sorry. So with A is two fifty. It's this is pretty interesting because in 2008, Microsoft released, I believe, this was around the time where Server 2008 came out, and before then. Your ticket granting ticket was encrypted with RC4. If you don't know, RC4 is outdated, and we jumped to AS AS256. What some attackers don't know is their script kitty tools use still use RC4, so we catch them a lot. There are other ways, but that's the one that I'm going to uh, give out today. So, <clears throat> next question. He ran an MF scan external to the target network and got no results. I ran an MF scan and got results with one key change. C? Or C's over here, I hear B. Bees, I have bees here. B is correct. So this one is another one that I learned pretty recently um, that a, a lot of uh, pen testers and a lot of red teamers just don't know. Um, I, I am aware that if you have a, a DNS server, you can't drop any packets that you're not expecting. So if there's an IP address that 
doesn't look right, you could drop that. But generally speaking, if you're scanning from the outside, if you tag source port 53 onto your MF scan, that's gonna be a best practice. <clears throat> so I don't know why this one is 500, I didn't, this one should be more, but your analyst sees the following IOC and SysMod event ID, what? And immediately reports it. There's a pattern here for IOCs. I give you 30 more seconds to Google. I can see. I hear C's. Yeah. Anyone want to care to explain why that would this would be C? Beaconing to the C2 server. It looks like it's doing discovery to me. Like it's trying to go from network to local host. I'm, I'm hearing things. <laughs> but that one is a redirect, so it's putting the output to that local file. So it's so let's so for for our group that. That have that have a little bit of experience. Can let's go back to our network admins for a minute and think of how they would normally run a ping. Would it be like this? No. no. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> this is malicious. At minimum, it's going to become an event, and um, it's just the nature of the beast as as far as just understanding that and. and an admin doesn't have time to, and a network admin doesn't have time to come up with these crazy uh, things just to uh, do simple things like ping. And just for everyone's, just to take something away from this, if you ever see a slash C, you should investigate it. Anyone know why? Calling another, uh, like another shell script. Yes, so with a slash C, you could, you're 80 to 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of the time, that's going to be run from a script or something that's pre, um, like an executable or, or something like that. And it can find you a lot of good wins for the blue team. <clears throat> so as a break from our questions, I want to share something else that I'm really excited about. Most of us know about the MITRE ATT&CK, initial access all the way to impact. I recently discovered the unified heel chain which describes how hackers, how adversaries interact with the, the, the network in a much more accurate fashion. Once you get an initial foothold, maybe you have a PHP web shell. You have to do all of these things before you make it to the network. And then I would argue you'd have to do all of that again to come here. I don't want to dig into this too long. I just want to show you something that could really help you understand an attacker's mind frame from the, I guess, from the mind of an attacker. And just understand that nothing is linear like the minor attack matrix. For, for the leaders in the room, a lot of times you want your reports in a linear fashion like minor attack, just keep it in mind, just keep in mind that things are more like the unified kill chain. Next question, do I, do I have any forensics experts in the room? Forensics malware analysis, I mean analysts, sorry, analysts in the room. Anyone want to take a stab at this one, just randomly? Hearing two answers from a gentleman nowhere in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta commit. Let's get a show of hands for C. What about, did I hear B? This one will really throw you off. It's gonna be D. So if you, that deeper report that I referenced earlier, a part of that TT, the TT people that attack her is they took Beacon DLL and they moved it to another box. 
and then they activated the deal though. It's crazy, but you, you, you just gotta, I guess, gotta keep up with uh, current current things. And it's tough. I know it's tough. It's, it's really tough. But I think what a lot of you just fell for with this question is availability bias. You saw a beacon DLL, and it went right straight to beaconing activity. It happens. It does. And I assure you that the adversary they know about our, our biases. The next one, I wanted to put Brute Retail in here just to give you some exposure to all three. Of, I, I call them the big three C2s. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna make this one quick. What do we got? B. B, I heard B. No, B. B? B? Delta. 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 Delta for everyone? Delta. Yikes. <laughs> So, I mean, it's just a matter of just, I guess, watching YouTube videos and at minimum just understanding. I would say understand an artifact from each major C2. And I think you, you have a, you'd have a decent foothold on what attackers are doing. I, I kept the same graphic there. So this one is an elk related, elk stack related question. We've gotten away from hacking a little bit. Where are my master gunners in the room? Do I have any master gunners? Anybody know what that is? Elastic search. Uh, uh, right. yeah. That's how like you're a B. I hear a B. Bravo. 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 Are you all B's? You're correct. You guys are awesome. You are. <laughs> so, ooh, went too fast. Too far there. So, this is basically L stack. I don't want to go over it too much. It's something that you can Google. Definitely, but um, it's pretty awesome when we, we lay on this pretty heavily uh, during our analysis at work. And not only us, but pretty much, this is, this is the way to go when you have big data. And if you are interested in hacking it, this is the box on Hack the Box where you can learn about the elk stack. A quick story about this, I was in Miami and uh, Anyone know A Rod or Alberto Rodriguez? By any chance? <laughs> yes, a few of us. So he told me, "Hey man, you really you, you want to do this? You want to do this box and just do it." And I spent maybe two days or two weeks, something like that. Um, but it taught me a lot about it, it. Taught me faster about the elk stack than just reading about it. It taught me exactly how. Log stash looks and the filters and the things and the configurations and such. And I would recommend if you are new to hacking, do it with a walkthrough. Nobody's judging. <clears throat> elk, red elk, I'm sorry. Red elk, if you haven't heard of, of this, is the red team in the adversary's implementation of uh, elk stack. And I want to turn your attention to this big red circle. So with many of us, the way that we operate, when we find a suspicious hash or a suspicious IP address or a suspicious domain, what do we do to confirm whether or not it's malicious? Anyone got anything? We check it. We go to the virus total. My man. Virus total. Exactly what we do. Is that the right answer? And this is why. As you, if, you, if you notice this little arrow here, this constantly queries to see if the red team's IOC is in virus total. So if the red team, little old red team, the little old Joe that works uh, in room three can download this and run this, guess who else can do this? Adversaries, threat actors, APTs. So it's always best practices to download your entire virus total database. I know that sounds ridiculous, but if we really want to get after our adversaries, we have to do ridiculous things sometimes. Help is another implementation of Elk Stack. It's pretty awesome. If you notice some of the stuff up there, it's gonna do all of the things for you. 
I think that's pretty much it for the things they use Elks Pack. Anyone recognize this? Yes. Yeah. I call this the OG of the Elk Stack. So Security Onion is awesome. If you haven't messed with it, please do. Please do, it is awesome. And I owe a lot to Security Onion and the, the, the good folks here. Um, and I, I think my organization does as well. <clears throat> All right, back to the questions. So this one is a, uh, a little bit harder, so staying true to the, the title there, they get increasingly harder. Anyone want to take a stab at this one? And don't fall victim to availability bias, because it is up there. I hear a D. Anyone else? Sure. Sir Charlie. Make sure you keep me in track of your points, please. I am not. B and, B and D seem like the same thing, right? You masquerade in order to pivot. Yes, there's one more correct answer. There's one more correct answer. There's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an answer that's more correct than another uh, one. Yeah, they're, they're, they're tough questions. <clears throat> so think of it like this. If I am an attacker and I place commands or any artifact or anything on the box, there's a point to it, right? There's an objective to do a thing. I heard a few D's, and you're correct if you chose D. So yes, you can masquerade your traffic because essentially what this command does is it turns your Linux box into a router. And this became pretty important, especially with the advent of cloud, because you had adversaries just pivoting through cloud provider networks. So this one is pretty insidious and it's pretty shocking how many people don't know about this one because it's, it, uh, if it's active, if all of these commands are active and running, uh, it's, it's pretty effective for the attacker. All right, now I will tell you, I will give you a warning. My, uh, my team at work, they absolutely hated this question, but I assure you, it, there is a method to the madness here. I'll explain it all. What we got? Delta. All of the above. We got deltas. Got anything else? Got an A? Delta. Bravo. I got Bravo, I got deltas. Did I hear A or not? A. <laughs> you are correct, sir. So this one is a little bit frustrating, but I will explain why it is not B and why it is not D. So with B, you have a bunch of vulnerable endpoints, but if I have an objective as an attacker, what do I care when they don't involve my actual endpoint, my, the one that I'm targeting? And as far as C goes, Active Directory is pretty much a mess. It, it, it does its own thing when it comes to where it wants you to access and what it wants you to access to where routing protocols become almost, I won't say irrelevant, but and they step down a bit because again, as long as you have that access, that right user, it's gonna find a way to get you access to whatever you need. So I wanted to go over a few <clears throat> remediations I was hoping we have more red teamers in here. And I wanted to just put this one on the slide by itself because it's so important. When attackers laterally move, they should be given a reason or, or a, a path to move from workstation to workstation. It's not necessary for business operations. It's not necessary for communication and it's just not necessary. So just block it at the GPO level. Uh oh, did I go too far? 
I want for all of my Windows experts and all of my Active Directory experts in here, can you tell me a reason other than convenience why you must have a domain administrator account when you can have an apps instead? If you want to Google that, you can do it as well. It's bonus points on the board. But you have to tell me in a sentence uh, uh, letter. Did you hear an answer? Okay. So uh, it break glass? Oh, we can get it. Go ahead. So it break glass? Break glass? For laps? Yeah. Okay, maybe I need to re re. Uh, so let's just say I go to go into an environment and they have domain admins everywhere, and they're not using laps. And I say, hey, stop using domain admins and use laps. Am I correct on that? What do you think? Incorrect. Incorrect. Because I would say because a local administrator account can only control the device that is admin. Mm. Can a local administrator account on the domain controller control the domain controller? No. 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 Can't. It can't log into the GPOs and the group policy objects and do its thing? That's a trick question because there is no local domain on, the do on an active directory domain controller. Yeah, it can't because you can't authenticate to the domain without the domain administrator. You got access to the computer though. So I would argue, and some of my questions are a little bit controversial, but I would argue that remove all of your domain administrators, remove all of that, and give granular permissions and privileges so that you can do what you have to do, and at minimum you can have one domain administrator, but I think America in general, we have to get away from convenience and we have to start really locking things down. I don't believe in any domain administrators, but I can't see how, especially when we start running our commands in the uh, command line and using RSA and such things, that people would feel the need to have like all of those privileges. But I assure you we can make them far more granular and we don't have to give one account the keys to the kingdom. All right, <clears throat> this one is a bit tricky as well. You gotta kind of know a little bit about Windows for this one. An adversary would like to migrate to a trusted Windows process. Which of the following processes is most attractive to an adversary? I think we're gonna argue about this one. C's. I hear C's. I hear C's. C's. I hear Delta. I have Delta this in, in Char Charlie's. What? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would happen. When I made the question, I knew it would happen. But we're going to debate this one. We're going to debate this one. <laughs> so the reason I put that one in here is I, I've been doing my own digging. So it's, it's tough to have all of your research as, as someone like me that just, just loves this stuff. Just going to Google only or going to classes to get that type of information is it's tough to actually see what attackers are actually doing. And so what I did was I, I spoke to he's not in here really good. I spoke to a young guy and he's working on man, can I really say this? Let me see. He is working on a project where someone can remotely watch his screen and take screenshots and feed that information back to ChatGPT where it gets uh, read and answered and then a question spits back to the, the uh, person on the computer. And he wanted to do all of this without detection, without anything. And I was like, and as, as I started asking him questions, he revealed to me that it works and the two processes that he said he aimed for were security related and update related. And so as I started doing digging, that process came up. And I, I, under, I do understand that 
LSAS is security related, but um, when it comes to processes that are on every SOX radar and every Threat Hunter's radar, LSAS may not be the process that you aim for. Again, that's why I said it's debatable because maybe it is. <coughs> Update related processes get killed in threat, uh, cyber threat intelligence. Google Updater is a big one. And um, so yeah, these are the two main ones. So if you have an EDR, if you watch an EDR at work, I would advise you if you are ignoring alerts from that security product, please go back and double check them because that's an attractive process to an adversary because it does so much. It can connect, it, can, it has root access or system access, whatever we're called with it. And it may have file access as well and probably registry access as well. So I think as we become more familiar and more comfortable in our fields, we have to get to that level of uh, granularity there. <clears throat> really, really excited about TLS fingerprinting. If you ever caught me at work and this conversation was going on, you probably, you probably saw a very excited version of me bouncing around and talking about job threes and job fours as well is not on here, but I want to get everybody's uh, take on the best practices for fingerprinting. And if you haven't heard of that, we can go over it after the question. Anyone ever heard of TLS fingerprinting? Yeah. I think it's D, 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 Delta, all of the above. I would also say that. I would say all are correct, but my favorite one is to capture a good baseline of fingerprints first. Just go ahead and capture that baseline. And I, I know it's tough because you got a lot of data. You have a, it's probably going to be tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of fingerprints, but that's good. You hunt the outliers, and of course, you, you're going to go down rabbit holes, but it's, it's a good start to uh, begin your hunt with a uh, fingerprint of a, either an outlier or a reported malicious uh, TLS connection. And this is uh, one of the examples of the new Dot 4, which came out, I think, maybe last week or two weeks ago. But I don't want to get into this because it's, it's really technical, but I'm really excited about the fact that a fingerprint can tell me whether my traffic is using a domain or an IP. I'm excited about that because I can know that without actually digging into the network traffic. You can also tell me the number of uh, cypher suites, which is pretty cool, especially as we start to to uh, get a fix on our adversaries. And then we have SSH as well, it's pretty cool. And then X509, I think we'll be hearing a lot more about softboards in, in the very near future. Also, if you manage any kind of uh, security onion stack or wires, any, any kind of, uh, I can't think of the actual term they use, but you can easily update from job three to job four, and you can also use them side by side. So, like I promised, they get extremely, like, it, it increasingly tough here. Um, I even have URL encoding and escaping in here as well, like the escaping of symbols. Anyone want to take a stab at this one? This is really good, especially if you've never seen attacker tradecraft or any IOCs from attackers. I'm giving you a lot of them in this presentation. A. A. Wow. Any, any other? To me, it looks like C, command and control. So you got one C, but download and reload. Can anyone explain why it's A? Uh, reaching out to his home IP address, basically. Oh. Navigating to the directory, downloading the exploit, running it, and then deleting it. Can you explain what the Tabot does? It makes it executable for all. Well, read, write, Yes. You got to make it 777, right? You got to let everybody have access, right? <laughs> yeah, plus X would do it. It's, it's how I would do it. I would, 
I don't know, I, I guess to each his own. But this is ingress tool transfer. I've done this maybe legally, maybe dozens of times. And uh, there are other ways to do this. So don't get fixated on things like W you get when you have curl out there as well. And understand, especially when you see things like this, it's like, why would a, an admin or a, a server admin remove as soon as he executes? So it's, it's a little bit of, even if you don't know what's going on, or even if you've never seen anything, anything like this, using some common sense and understanding why wouldn't a server admin go the easy route? Why would they go? So in this situation, like the threat actor already has installed a web server that's going to interpret the query string and pass it to the shell? Is that, like you get the, you get somebody to type in this or run this, access this URL, which is taking them to their local host running port 80? Yeah, so just to go over this one more time, I, I think I kind of, I messed up here. I don't have a, uh, this was supposed to be a PHP shell. Or maybe it is. Yeah, yeah, that works. But essentially, the attacker puts this, well, yeah, I see what you mean now. I do have local holes here. Presentation's not perfect, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> There's definitely local holes there, but um, just pretend like that's not local holes and you got yourself some good old ingress tool transfer. Thanks for pointing that out. Because <laughs> to me, it looked like it wasn't an initial access. But right. anyway, yep. gotcha. All right. Now this one is a, this one has a little bit of a obscure, I don't know what to call it. Um, when I found out about this, I, w I was, I was very shocked. Um, but anyone, anyone want to take a guess at uh, which tool I can use if I am completely out of the network, I don't have any credentials, no smart card, I don't have a password or anything. I see LDAP long man. Have you heard of that before? Charlie, how, how long before do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, sir. Charlie, anyone heard of this tool before now? Once. Once. Twice now. Twice now, okay, I, I got you. <laughs> I got you over there. Oh, man. So when I used this tool, I was so shocked and I was so taken aback. So there is a protocol that LDAP users called, man, I don't want to get this wrong. Yes, it is called CLDAP. That's basically a ping request for LDAP. And as long as you have a good name, a good name list, you can enumerate that whole directory for usernames. Now, I know what some people are going to say. You just got a username. You're not going to be able to log in. But I would argue, thank you, I would argue that if I have a good username, that is a, a good username list that I have taken from your network, that's a means of social engineering, that's a means of harassing your employees, and that's a means of finding my way to the top via social engineering. So, yeah, pretty scary stuff. <laughs> but uh, I used this on a, uh, on a machine once, and I, I, was, I was very impressed. This is our last question, so I want everyone to kind of dig in here. 50,000 points. What is the above artifact? And I use a lot of Linux for a reason, because I think as a community, we can use a lot more Linux knowledge here. Yes. Bravo. Bravo. <coughs> Privilege escalation. I got one privilege escalation, and I got like, what, 10 privilege per per persistences? And an A. Who said me? Anyone said me? Can you explain, sir, why it is B? Yeah, it's B because that's the uh, RSA public key, and the attacker is putting that in the authorized key file, giving him access to that box every time he comes in with the private key. Anyone agree or disagree? I think he's giving him free access. 
escalation to root. He could already write to root, so. Yeah. So he's correct. So the reason why it is not privileged escalation is he's already root. So all he's doing is making sure he can get back in. And with SSH, it's super important to understand SSH because it is uh, it is often brute force from the uh, from external networks and understanding public key authentication versus private key authentication is crucial because once I do this as an attacker, can anyone tell me the significance of this as far as my access goes? How easy it makes it for me? Yes, no password. Absolutely no password. Now, if you are an SSA aficionado, you will say, well, you can have a passcode for the public key, and that is true. You could, you could set something up like that, but the adversary would be hamstringing himself. So again, yeah, we still the same point, right? No password, or his own password if he would like to be secure himself or something, I don't know. So. King of the Hill is pretty awesome. If you don't have access to try hack me or just please get an account because you know, I think one of the ways that I learned quickest is you see it in red and blue, attack and then defend. How many, how much time do Five? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, yes. So attacking and defending is so fun. You get in and then you lock the rest of the players out. And just by doing that over and over again, you learn so much about Linux, SSH, the ways people typically access boxes, and how you can just cut that off. Um, so I, I definitely recommend it. You're probably gonna lose a bit when you first start, but it's okay. Just uh, stick with it. Eventually, you'll be gaining points. It's, I highly recommend it. And these are my final thoughts. I just ran you through a lot of questions, and uh, they are, they're near, near, near to my heart. And I would say quiz your team members, quiz your subordinates, whether you're a pen tester, whether you, whether you do anything in, in this field technically, because I assure you that expert you have, that one guy with OSCE in the back, at some point those fallacies, those biases are gonna to start to sway his, his focus away from the actual objective. And as well, we, we have hubris, right, we're human. So some, at some point, we, as we relax on our expertise, we begin to go in different directions that don't serve the organization. So Quizzy can do all of that. You can keep people focused and, and give people those thump to chomp questions. ChatGPT is not the devil. It's a, it's a companion. It's kind of like how they say about money, where they say, Money is a good servant, but a terrible master. Chat TPT is a good servant, but a terrible master. Learn red and blue. I have my, a, kind of my go-to moves for training myself um, on Hack the Box. I start with hacking with a walkthrough, and then I do all of these things, and then if I can, I try to install some security on the box and then repeat the hack. And it'll, it'll teach you about the full gambit, and um, I have a lot of fun with it. I would also say, try to speak if you can. Speak to you, speak at work, and eventually come to something like this, and then try it out, embarrass yourself a little bit, have some fun with it. Eventually, I think you get a lot more polished with what you say and a lot more polished with your presentation. Question everything, question everything. Everything you see, every field, every header, I know some of us go through a lot of data. Don't let one data field, one header, one HTTP header because you never mess with it. Don't let that stuff just go because that's where the adversary is aiming. And finally, I would say, go get your search for you. I know a lot of us want to have kind of a, uh, a super collection of certs or uh, the collection of certs that every employee wants to see. Well, I would argue that your path is near and dear to your heart. And 
Although with me being a blue teamer, I aim for all red team shirts, and the reason for that is that's where my heart was, and that's how I learned fastest. Um, and and that's what that's my final, I guess, tip for you. you know? And I think that's going to be it. So. I want to do one final thing. Who has the highest points? Who believes they have the highest points? How many? 61,000. Here we have. How, how many points do you have? Uh, 56,000. 65. <laughs> 61, 65. Anyone can beat 61? All right. 61, 65. Well done. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.